welcome to this property and finance special with me, Gemma Forte. We're here at the London Stock Exchange Studios, right in the heart of London, for our monthly debate on issues related to property and finance. And we have some of the country's industry experts with us who are invited to share unreservedly, that was my promise, their views about property and finance related topics. So please welcome to the London Stock Exchange Studios today's guests. We have Tony Gimple, Pirigesh Sivanason, and Stephen Galpin. Welcome, gents. Good to see you all here today. Now, in today's programme, we're going to be getting the views of our panellists on subjects which include tax avoidance within the property industry, purchasing off plan, the pros and cons, and the government's long-term tenancy incentives. Are they just a pipe dream? But first, getting Britain building. So, Pirigesh, I'm going to start with you. So, firstly, it looks like we are facing one of the biggest housing crises we've seen in years and years and years. Um, and in fact, due to a new report that's been published, in order to keep up, we need to be building, I think we're, we, need, we need 4 million homes and we need to be building at least 340,000 a year until 2031. I mean, this is just unbelievable. And of course, homelessness is on the rise. And I think the biggest thing to discuss is that out of all those homes that are needed, what we really require is affordable housing. What's your views on all of this? Um, I think the first thing is, you know, to be honest, it's almost like a bit of a broken record. Mm. You know, if we look back 30, 40, 50 years, maybe when there was only four channels on TV, we may not have had the stats, but Britain was still not building enough houses. Mm. And no matter what government has come in, no matter what legislation has come in, there's been a chronic shortage of the ability to build new houses, to find, and I think that can be broken down into a number of different areas. I think one of the biggest issues we've got is planning. Mm. Um, it's absolutely right that green belt land perhaps should be saved, um, but the way in which innovation can be used with the planning process, it's just not a process that anyone really understands how long it will take and or the likely outcome dependent on each project. So what mm. that means is, to start with, you know, where does, where does new houses come from? It comes from an idea, it comes from a design, it comes from a plan. And when you've got a planning system which doesn't allow a regularization of um, a methodology that allows certainty, yeah. it can make it really difficult for builders, but also for funders. You know, how are you supposed to, for example, debt, which is often used in building, in planning, it's really, really difficult. The amount of um, debt that uh, um, a builder could get on something without planning is typically less than 50% of the value of the land. Yes. It means the amount of equity required is a lot more. And why is that? It's because of the risk, because there is no certainty. You know, w one week you might get a planning approval, the next week you may, you may get a rejection. Right. Moving on from the planning process, the next thing is actually around the build and construction itself. Mm. A lot of the people that I speak to are SME builders. You know, people who are maybe four, five, 10, 50 strong. Um, they've felt often, um, they've, had, they've not been involved in the house building process. It's really almost a cartel of kind of larger house builders. When you look at the amount of small house builders um, actually in the market today, yeah. it's reduced something like by 80% over the last 30, 40 yeah, years. Yeah, and maybe that's where one of the most inherent problems lie, because I think although you, there's a huge shortage of affordable housing, there's a glut of these sort of luxury flats that have cropped up everywhere, and a, quite a lot of them are empty, all being bought by foreign investors. And, you know, as you say, it's difficult for any government to solve, but back in the 70s, we were spending 18 billion pounds on creating more housing, and now it's gone down to 1.1 billion. So that's a massive, massive reduction. And, and at the same time, therefore, sort of benefits have risen drastically, and homelessness is, is, is increased. So I think it is correct to call it a crisis. It is a crisis, but mm. it, it's, it's been a crisis from the very beginning. As Piri Gish rightly said, it's nothing new. All governments, uh, particularly post-war ones, have had a complete failure of long-term infrastructure planning. Mm. Um, they use uh, tax as a blunt instrument, they give the wrong incentives, the wrong messages. Right. And aren't prepared to make the investment necessary, have the political will necessary, mm. to solve these kind, kinds of social crises within a generation, let alone a term or two 
in Westminster. Yeah. Well, mm. I think what I would add to that is that, um, so for example, the government have done some things, you know, they've created the, the Home Builders Fund, you know, yeah. we're talking about two, two to three billion pounds available, but how much of it is really being used? Uh, if you compare that to businesses, the British Business Bank came out and has worked with a lot of alternative lenders in order to get those funds where it's needed into the SME space. Now, what I'd really like to see is the Home Builder Fund being used in a very similar process, yeah. either because there is plenty of money around. You know, we've, we've spoken about on different programs, there's plenty of money wanting to invest in the UK yeah. in property. So what's the best way that this, prop this fund could be used? Now, I personally think what we want to see is it being used in the equity space to allow then debt lenders to come in and support on the larger basis. But what that does is you use the three billion and you can leverage that up to potentially 15 billion, mm. you know, 20 billion to then really create something and momentum. Because mm. the thing with government organizations, they clearly have a good will. But on the other hand, it's how can we, it, it's lenders today, alternative lenders have the skill sets to, to appraise projects quickly. And they also see a number of projects come through. If they can liaise appropriately with a government organization, and also, by the way, if things go well, there's a return for the government as well. It's yes, not just yes. it's not in just many a ways, it's, I'd say. Exactly. Yeah, in many ways. So it's interesting that you've you've pinpointed um, planning as being one of the specifics or barriers, because also I think it's quite fascinating. We always talk about what a crowded little island this is, but actually only ten percent of land is taken up by you know, bu building basically. So there is space, isn't there? So maybe, as you say, it all comes down to that bit because there is money, there is the will to do it, there's the need for it. So, you know, what? why isn't it being done? Uh, and also, to be honest, the other thing is clarity helps uh, business planning yeah. and also financing. Yeah. So, you know, if, for example, we want more affordable housing, some of the legislation needs to come in and provide certainty so that yes so that's uh, going to be a good investment it's going to be a good investment but <laughs> yeah. also it allows the market some time to react and for land prices to appropriately change mm -hmm. because the, the the fundability of something if it's there's no affordable housing on there versus whether there is affordable is mm. is very very different and what we shouldn't do is have constant changes where a developer might go in really wanting to put extra housing mm. now maybe you're right it's not the right type of housing but they've gone in in good faith yeah the legislation then changes this site is now no longer profitable for them potentially they could make a loss on it if they were to build it out as it is now i don't think the legislation is meant to do that mm. and so you know some thought needs to be given in terms of the progress and how it's actually rolled out yeah and, and something i'll have to give because in the meantime you've got people living with their parents now till they're you know in their 30s you've got people putting off having families because they're not in the appropriate accommodation and so on and so forth. But I tell you what, we'll move on now to our next subject, which is about building specifically uh, to rent. Now, Tony, would you say that this is a practical idea for developers and indeed landlords to buy yes. purely for that market? Yes. Um, build to build to, purely for that market. Build to rent is a fantastic opportunity. Okay. Uh, commercially, socially, it helps solve some of the issues that we've talked about. Um, government is now talking about having much longer term rental agreements. Yes. It's, it's been there for a very long time. Mm. You know, there, there are people who are private social landlords giving families you know, places for life if they pay their rent. Which yes. Is what anybody else would do. Yeah. And, and when we talk like that, it, it, this is how I think it should be. Yep. Uh, it's a mutually agreeable yep. thing between a tenant and a landlord. And I think, as you know, we've talked about before on previous shows, landlords sort of have this sort of certain reputation that isn't fair on all landlords. Right. But we do need to nurture that, that if you want to be a landlord, it should be mutually agreeable. And that possibly does mean not saying after two years, right, you're out, so I've changed my mind. I think they, they, they put the um, thing as the donut economics. Oh, right. A much more rounded right. solution. So you're yeah. not just looking at the finances, yes. you're looking at the impact on the use of those finances, yeah. the people who live there, yeah. what they put back. So a much more holistic way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because you do hear now of people, I, I heard on the radio the other day, a, a chap who'd moved 
eight times in two years or something yeah. because of his, <laughs> just flats not being right or then getting kicked out yeah. and so on and so forth. And he was just absolutely sick to the back teeth of it. Yeah. And he sounded like a good tenant as well. I don't think he was having parties till three in the morning. That is a good tenant, sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong programme. <laughs> yeah, and I think that perhaps, again, with the, the, the lack of the ability to just get on the property ladder these yeah. days, you know, then perhaps renting is going to become something that that we view more like the Euro, you know certain European countries where yeah. owning your house isn't everything like it always has been as part of our sort of British culture, like your home is your castle. But if that's going to happen, then the whole culture will have to change. Would you not think, Stephen? I think so, but I, I think what we have to do is to go back to perhaps the 80s when assured shorthold tenancies were brought in. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to go back to the 80s for well, lots of reasons, well, yes, the fashion mainly. Anyway. <laughs> um, you've got tenancies that were brought in to give, you know, we've talked about surety for people, people developing or people buying. Those, those landlords wanted surety of being able to get their properties back, which was why assured shorthold tenancies were brought in. Okay. And one worry that I have now is if we start doing away with that, we're already seeing a decline in the number of buy-to-let landlords, mm. a decline in the investment. Quite a serious decline, isn't yeah. it? And then and that's because of tax um, changes. It's because of tax changes, and again, um, you know, we live in a, cha a changing world. Things change very quickly these days. And I wonder, you see, if, if the average buy-to-let landlord can properly commit to a five-year or ten-year tenancy. Mm. What are the circumstances? What are their employment circumstances to be able to maintain offering that property? Mm. It's a very difficult subject. And I, I, I just worry that the government really is kicking the can down the road a little bit, encouraging I rental. I they're doing that with a few things well, at the moment. Aren't they? <laughs> aren't they just? But you see, the, pro the, the problem is, let's just take for an example um, a, a young couple. Let, let's say they ha they're in perfectly normal, respectable employment, but perhaps with little prospects mm. of the future. Mm -hmm. So they're going to go through life renting a property for a commercial rent, and that's fine. They'll probably manage this, two of them working perhaps brief respite while they have a family, back to work again and carry on. But do tell me, what are they going to do when they're 65 mm -hmm. and they're on 600 and something pounds a month? Who's going to be paying the mm -hmm. commercial rent they're paying? Mm -hmm. And this is the can that's being kicked down the road. Mm -hmm. And really, we need to get to grips with, you're right about building the right number of houses, but essentially, it's about finance. I can tell you, you know, I, I speak to developers every week. You can have as many houses built as you want if they think they can sell them. Mm -hmm. And being able to sell them comes down to affordable mortgages. Yeah. And just very quickly, if I can just finish on this, if you take the car industry, which went into the doldrums exactly the same time as the property industry did in 2008, 2009, They've, they've come out covered in gold. Why? Because we can all go out and we can buy a fancy car on a few thousand pounds down and how much ever it is, it is a month. Yeah. What, what this government and the bank has done is, is, is actually um, strengthen the bank's balance sheets by mm. insisting on 30-40% equity when they buy, but it's been done at the expense of our young people. Yeah. That's the trouble, and that's the problem we have to solve. I would agree. I think that's a good analogy as well, because I think the car market is all is adapting as well. In that, so many people are leasing now mm. and finding new ways to own a car. Mm. You know, I would never buy a brand new car, but I lease one. That mm. works really well for me. Whereas perhaps the housing market isn't adapting for what is needed right now, and there's no solution, is there? Because no. the people that do own property don't want to see it completely decrease in value, and so on and so forth. But something's going to have to happen. Uh, I would maybe just add, if this time. In, in terms of um, you know finding solutions, mm. I think by the built the whole built to rent model, what it does do is it opens it up for the first time to really institutional investors, and they're going to come in with a lot of cash and potentially see things very differently to a perhaps traditional buy to let investor. So that does two things: one, it provides a different type of supply, a different type of product to the market. It also says to the existing buy to let investor, you can't really be an accidental landlord anymore. Mm. You've got to compete with genuine product in the yeah. market. And as the asset class starts to develop, just like, for example, car leasing, people will start to think of how to maybe provide permanent equity into housing, yeah. which means that the amount 
people own perhaps we've seen shared ownership mm. and it might be to be a, a natural progression of that mm -hmm. whether any of this is good or bad i don't know but but certainly innovation will come there's so much to say but sadly that's all we've got time for in this part of the program but join us after this short break when we'll be discussing tax avoidance and wealth tax so don't go away To property and finance with me Gemma Forte and my guests today who are Tony Gimple, Piragesh Sivanathan and Stephen Galpin. Right chaps, our uh, rather contentious issue that we're going to be discussing now is tax avoidance in the property industry. So are there any holes within it? Are they being widely explored and what is happening here? I do think at the moment, obviously, people are so concerned generally with the political climate at the moment. We need money for housing. We need money uh, for the NHS. You know, obviously, Theresa May bunging the DUP a billion pounds. I think people are more aware than ever about where the money is being spent and, and where is it going. Yeah. And tax avoidance is such a hot potato at the moment, but I know that sometimes there are very legal ways to do it. So when it comes to the property industry, you're the expert, Tony, what is happening? Do those loopholes still exist? I'm certainly not an expert on tax avoidance, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I didn't mean that, yeah. Sorry, for the avoidance of doubt, <laughs> as they say. Um, are there any loopholes? Let's break the question down. Yeah. Tax avoidance is not something that is, is prevalent in one industry or another. Mm. And up until very recently, to avoid tax was perfectly legal and acceptable. So with press stories of anybody who has avoided tax going down like a not a, not a good thing with the general public, no. what is happening in the world of property to avoid these loopholes? Well, there, there, are, there are no things as loopholes in, in property or elsewhere. We don't have a unified tax system. Okay. You can introduce one tax without thought of where it will have impact elsewhere. Mm. Is something a trading business? Is it an investment business? Is it an active income? Is it a passive income? Can you claim it against expenses? Or, with Section 24 for landlords in particular, mm. would an, would, for any other business, their, 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 their finance costs would be deductible? Not if you're a landlord. It's now part of your profit. Mm. Would you say it's gone too far, um, legislating against landlords yes. now? because we have seen a sharp decrease, haven't we, in uh, people wanting to invest in buy-to-let properties? It's not so much we've seen a sharp decrease in people wanting to invest in buy-to-let properties. Mm. What we have seen is those people for whom it was never a business, they were the true accidental landlords. Okay, yeah. For them, yes. So they've they inherited a flat or they've had a little bit of income and they thought, what should yeah. we do with this 20 years ago? And they've bought a secondary property. Yeah, and they've had two properties before. Mm. They, they shack mm. up together, another mm. one, mm. and so on. It, it was a good thing to do, but it took otherwise available housing stock away from the market. Mm. And they were playing at it. But what it has done is put supply back on the market for the professional, larger, institutional landlord, for that mm. matter, mm. who can now legitimately mitigate their taxes through running as a professional property business. Okay. They can do bill to rent, they can act as semi-social, social landlords. So on the one hand, you know, Section 24 was truly terrible. Uh, it was a real horror story, mm. nightmare in the making. But on the other hand, what did John Johnson say, the prospect of imminent death concentrates the mind wonderfully? <laughs> <laughs> the market has had to innovate to survive yeah. and things like tax avoidance will disappear because yeah. there's no need to. There's, there's enough opportunity out there yeah. to take tax as yet another transactional cost yeah. and mitigate it, minimise it as any other business would within the law. Would you agree with that Stephen? Well I would but I'd like to take the conversation up a stage in terms of value and talk about perhaps developers that are um, what shall we say, exploiting the tax situation that we have in this country. And let me give you an example. You could have money coming in from offshore trusts in Jersey, Guernsey, Panama, those kind of places, to fund the developments. Because why? Well, 
One, our banks here are still very, very nervous. To, I mean, to build a 50, 60 story mm. blog, it's 250 million or 300 million these days. It's a lot of money. And the banks here, because of the 209 crisis, um, are saying, hmm, maybe a bit strong for us. Um, we'd like it sort of splitting between banks, consortiums. That's always very difficult when you're a developer to, to do mm. that, deal with a number of banks. So the money comes in offshore, maybe from Russia, maybe from wherever. Um, the money is sent into a small management company here mm -hmm. who handles the development and then the proceeds are sent offshore without payment of profit here. Right. And the management charges here tend to soak up any potential profit liability. And so these buildings are very profitable. You mentioned mm -hmm. earlier these buildings being purchased by uh, people from the Far East, from the Asia Pacific Rim, that sort of thing. And that's very true. I wouldn't necessarily demonise it. They're not the properties that are going to be for affordable rent or taking up space that are going to be for building that kind of product. They've served their purpose in keeping the construction industry working for the last 10 years. Yeah. You know, so no need to demonise it. It's just a different facet of the business. But I, but I, I do get quite angry when I see this... Um, flow of money just going offshore yeah. without proper taxation. I mean, if you look at that, if you say it's 250 million, you could reckon that the receipts are going to be five or 600 million, mm. healthy profits, and a huge tax liability, which should be paid should here, be paid which here, should yeah. then be funneled into and rehousing. if it was, then I think it would be less irksome that a lot of those properties do sit empty well, for it, it, much it, of the year. Because it, I think with such a crisis on our hands, <laughs> people needing to be housed, that, that is irksome. I like well, that it, well it, it is. But, you know, where you have a visa regime, for instance, where you say if you invest five or ten million pounds in, in, in the UK, you can get your visa, you can have an entrepreneur's visa. Uh, what do you think people are going to invest it in? They're mm. going to invest it in lovely property in Belgravia or yeah. Park Lane yeah. or somewhere like that and sit on it and watch it grow. Um, yeah. It's natural. So actually we're creating our own problems. And you know, we are obviously taught being very London centric at the moment. Yes. And I think that actually there's a lot of big cities at the moment who are building other types of properties. Manchester, yeah. Edinburgh's on the rise, yeah. Leeds. Um, so that particular issue is very sort of London centric, but it mm. does mean that London as a capital is changing all the time, isn't mm. it? Because everybody else is being pushed out and other, other parts are being gentrified. As you say, therefore, for every negative, there are some positives, I suppose, as things spread into other areas. Yeah, but, that, but that's nothing new, it's been happening since yeah. Roman times and, and before, that, that's London. Yes. There's an inflow and there's an outflow. The wealth permeates, hopefully, yeah. to the regions as opposed to offshore. Yeah. Which may be legal, but at times can be you know, morally repugnant. Now, what about wealth tax? Now, this sounds like a great problem to have. It's not something I've had to really wrestle with yet. <laughs> but is it a good problem to have? What do you think, Pirigash? Um, I, I think the primary issue with, with wealth tax, I can understand the concept of it, mm. is one of cash flow. Um, if you're going to tax someone because of their wealth, they may not, say for example, the classic that is often introduced is uh, the old lady that owns a asset that maybe is three or four million pounds, but her actual income is very little. Mm. And so by taxing her based on her wealth, she may just not have the cash flow to actually make that payment. In of itself, taxing assets does make some sense, but it's, mm. it's that bit about how do you ensure that someone has the cash flow to actually be able to pay those taxes mm. without being penal and creating some sort of other knock-on effects. I think mm. that's that's one of the key issues. I know, personally, I always think it's better to go after the corporations and get them to be paying the tax that they should be rather than the individual. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> pay the tax you're meant to pay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the easiest way of dealing with it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You have to pay tax in order to be able to live in a society where you can argue about yeah. not paying tax. But there tax. are lots of big businessmen who <laughs> don't, of course. you know, mm. they have their addresses in. But also part of that is just the complexity, you know, to conclude both points mm. in, in terms of both landlords and, and kind of offshore is, mm. is the complexity of the system A, yeah. which provides loopholes for people who are very, very intelligent to be able to find those loopholes. But so a simplicity of that would make it a lot easier, mm -hmm. um, you know, in order for then people to know what sort of taxes they are going to pay. Yeah. Cash versus equity. What would you say, um, Stephen, is king in terms of property investment? 
Well, I, I, I think the, the old adage that says you should never box yourself into a corner when buying property is probably the best one. So never take on a commitment that's beyond your means, never take on a commitment that's going to force you into a situation of sale. Um, so like with most things in life, a balance of both, I think. Mm. I know the trouble is these days as well with jobs, you know, the contracts, you don't have that, that sort of old fashioned thing now, being in a job for life, do you necessarily? Things can change within a couple of years. Mm. So it's quite hard, isn't it? Well, I think, I, I think also we have to look at the way that lending is, is, is put into the housing market. I mean, again, if we go back to the 80s, it was mainly building societies that would lend money. And that local manager would know your situation, he'd know your job prospects, he'd know who was building up the yeah. road, you know. But of course, that all changed when they wanted to become banks under the sort of Thatcher regime. They changed. And of course, now we have banks that shot into the market pure commercial enterprises so they make their decision one month they want to be in one month they want to be out i mean one of the pet things i would say is i again coming back to this lending business i'd like to see banks um, ring fencing their uh, residential property lending and not be allowed to sell those mortgages on mm -hmm. because you know if they, if they gave a 25-year mortgage mm. and knew they got it for 25 years, yeah. they'd be an awful yeah. lot more considered about who and how they lent. Yes. But what it would also do is allow them to lend at higher levels. Mm. So I don't think that the delinquency rate would go up an awful lot, but I think charging those banks as to having their control over their lending for life would help tremendously. Oh, actually, I think there is a potential solution to some of the problems. Mm. Just look at the ter terminology, bank building society. Mm. Building societies are for the common interest and are inherently fit for purpose. Yeah. They take deposits, lend them out. And yes, they have to make a profit to survive to keep doing it, whereas banks have become more than just cash handling centres, they're to a large degree, they become investment houses. Yes. So if you could go back to older times in that sense, splitting the two, where there is, uh, if you like, a, a, a national building bank, and that's been muted many times, mm. call it building societies if you like, keep it in private hands, none of this year and put the banks where they used to be in a, in a more merchant facility, that would help. Well, at one time, you, you, you would only have a, a mortgage on your house from a bank if, in fact, you were in business and, yes. uh, and that house want, and it was needed to charge yeah. against the overdraft yes. or something like that. Yeah. You'd always have it from the building society. But I also think it would be actually easier for the authorities, whoever they might be in, in, in control of this, to ring fence uh, residential uh, mortgages by having perhaps lower out of sync interest interest rates for the first time buyer um, wouldn't be a problem. It's not mm. a huge amount mm. of money. Um, it, it would hardly make a dent in anything. And of course, after 2008, 2009, the big mm. crash, it did become so much harder to get a mortgage. Do you think that that is going to just ease off slightly, given that some people now are paying rent that they can afford and it's quite considerable, but they can't get a mortgage where they'd be paying less every month by some of, you know, considerable amount. Well I think what you'll find is that, that new entities will come into the market and mm. it'll gradually it'll gradually ease and gradually get but better. But maybe just stay not <laughs> not mm. get completely out of control mm. like it did. Absolutely. I, I Hopefully think, we've learnt our lesson. I think the other interesting thing um, both my colleagues are sort of talking about you know going back to the heyday of, of, of good solid lending yeah. um, which I absolutely agree with but also you know we, we've got a huge amount of technology in the property industry now today um, we've got things like big data, AI, that are supposedly making some of the decision makers, uh, decision making better. Okay. Um, and also innovation. So actually, we've got crowdfunding. We've got the ability to actually take some of the banks out of the system and actually lend directly. So both the depositor and the uh, borrower are actually having a direct relationship. That is good and bad. It's not all great. But, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of innovations today which mm. need to be tapped in to ensure that maybe we have to take a different approach to residential lending than perhaps we've done previously. Well, you know, on that subject, if you're, if you're a mortgage broker, you, you have to become qualified, you're, you're tested on your ability to be able to um, give good advice mm -hmm. to especially first time and, and, and young buyers. Um, I'd quite like to see um, young first time buyers have some kind of education mm -hmm. with that broker. 
you know, again, sorry to go back, but years, years ago, um, you go to the building society, the guy there would say, well, you know, we've got a bit of money coming in in December, so we can probably arrange a mortgage for then, and I'd like to see you just save a little bit in between. And he'd give you a little chit, and uh, mortgage in principle, yeah, and you'd yeah. take that off to the local builder, and he'd be happy as Larry with that, yeah. you know? Um, I think people do need to understand about sustainability and what the responsibility is. It is fascinating to sort of think back to our heyday, but also, as you say, we need to start looking forward and thinking about all that technology that could change things. So don't go away, because although we're taking a gentle pause now, as soon as we get back, we'll be looking at off-plan purchases and longer-term tenancies. So don't go away. To finance and property with me, Gemma Forte, and my distinguished guests today, who are Tony Gimple, Pyrrhogesh Sivanason, and Stephen Galpin. Okay, off plan. What are the benefits and drawbacks for both developers and buyers of off plan purchases? Now, Stephen, I actually did this. My first ever purchase was off plan at the tender age of 20 something. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm sure things have changed since I, think, I did that. I think there are, two, there, there, there are two sides to this, obviously. There's the side that the uh, developer takes and the side that the purchasers take. Mm. Um, we're living in a, a, a time when there's much criticism about property inflation, and that inflation, to some extent, is, is, is blamed for causing the shortage and the difficulty for young people buying, which mm. I think we're all passionate about. We want to open that up. Now, well, we don't want our kids living with us for the rest of our well, lives either. I think that's probably it is, right. It is a thing to think about. <laughs> but I think, I, I think where, where the difficulties come is that buying from plan, um, I, I will make this London-centric, but it does apply to the bigger cities, Manchester, Nottingham, perhaps Birmingham. Um, it does cause terrible inflation. And let, mm. me, let me just explain why. Let's say we have a tower block here, and yep. let's say a one-bedroom flat is, I don't know, £400,000. OK. Developer comes along, wants to buy the site next door, and he wants to build, and it's going to take him three years. So what does he do? He looks, he, he looks at the last two or three years, the inflation rate, and it's probably running at probably between 8 and 10%, realistically, in some of the nicer areas. Yeah. So he says, OK, well, that's three years. It's going to take me to build it, so that's 30% up. So there he takes his 400000 and he ups it by... 30% and there we are, that's how he sets the price. Now that's then taken out to Hong Kong, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, all around the world to be sold off plan. Probably not quite so much here now because people here are now a little bit more careful and a little bit more wary of being able to fund mm. something that they're committing to for three years on. That's a very big ox for somebody to do. Mm. Whereas in those Asia Pacific areas, um, it, it, it's very much easier and even the London prices are considered quite low. But what happens is then, the guy in the, in the original block mm. with his £400,000 um, one bedroom flat or whatever he has says, hmm, I'm ready to sell now. Now, where do I get a guide on my price? Oh, well, next door, that's 30% up. So why don't I put mine up 20% and it'll look quite reasonable against what they're selling. And it creates its own inflation within that small, small area. And you can see that happening time and time mm, again mm. in London. Mm. Now, what does it mean for our people here buying? I would suggest you've got to be very, very brave to buy off plan these days with mortgages being so difficult. I mean, my colleagues might be able to tell better than me, but I, I don't know what the chances are of being able to get a commitment from a bank or a building society or any other kind of funder three years on. Mm. And so actually, it's all a bit of a futile process. Yes, it's funding lots of luxury developments in London, but it's doing nothing, nothing at all, to solve our need for affordable I know. housing and, 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 and properties to rent I was going to say, what about all this affordable housing that we need? Surely there's a builder out there somewhere who's building a nice cul-de-sac with, you know, 30 houses on it. There are. That, um, Right, there so are. can you buy those off plan? Perhaps if it stacks up commercially and if you're prepared to take the risk that mm. Stephen mentions. Mm. The real issue is that property is just treated with one broad brush 
and we're not. And th the example we've got here on the one is traditional property development for the local market to live the rest of their lives. Yeah. The other yeah. Yeah, is an investment vehicle. It's like an equity or a gilt or a futures. Mm. The fact that it's made out of steel, wood, concrete, yeah. etc., is immaterial. It should be treated more as a security. Than as, yeah. than as property in the sense that we know it. Yeah, although, as Stephen said, you know, you're right, that then impacts on everybody That's around. Absolutely. So, and you're talking about figures, you know, and it is laughable, really. £400,000 for a one-bedroom flat, absolutely realistic, and yet so ridiculous when you look that wages have not gone up for years. I mean, the, the, They're just completely plateauing. There's parts of London that I can see on the backdrop there where, yeah. where a one-bedroom flat is now 800,000. Yeah, pounds. completely and utterly. And these are just figures that you just... Do you even want to spend that much money on a one-bedroom flat? I mean, mm. it is a joke, isn't it? Mm. And I, when I did get my first flat, I don't mind saying it was £90,000 for a two-bedroom, really spacious flat in Clapham. I think the other thing, though, <clears throat> Is in, is in terms of the cycle and where we're at. Mm. Um, you know, we, there needs to be some appreciation for the fact that, for example, if we look at London, the market has slowed down a little. Mm. Um, and for developers, also, the, the easy access to finance or the lack of it also means that for them, unless they can get a certain percentage of our plan, mm. well, that development never gets built anyway. Yeah. So there, there, there needs to be, I agree, that perhaps there needs to be something in the middle that means that banks can commit or help British investors get on the ladder. Mm -hmm. But this all goes back to the planning that was made in the first place, whether it should have been that luxury flat or whether it should have been something more affordable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But off plan per se, um, actually, I don't think it's particularly bad, and I think it can be good in many, many reasons. But yeah. also, developers today are taking much more risk than they have done at any point since 07 or 08. Because, because of the economic climate, yeah, because of Yeah, because Brexit. the market's much more difficult. So when people say, oh, we're definitely gonna, they're definitely going to get 20% margin, or that's not the case, yeah. because actually when it gets yeah. built, yeah. The, it may be less, they may be making a loss. Costs on the meanwhile are going up as well in the construction industry, you know, there's a huge skills shortage, mm -hmm. you know, so while actually we talk about wage not going up, in the construction industry there's such a shortage, again, mm -hmm. like the property industry, that those costs are going up. So it, you know, it, it is complex, but yeah. I think developers at the moment are taking on quite a bit of risk. It, it is complex, but that complexity brings its own simplicity in the sense that build to rent gives you the best of both worlds. You can deploy your capital, all right, you don't get a short-term capital return, but you get long-term income. And income you've got today, whereas capital, you may not be able to realise in three years' time, like when you're selling off plan or building off plan. Mm. So the, the, the two things aren't mutually exclusive. No. It just needs a bit of common sense. You know, Darkham and bottle of scotch, bang their heads together until they get it right. <laughs> Too much to ask for, I suppose. Is that well, me being I, idealistic? I think, I think the point you made earlier, you know, you cannot solve this problem as, a, 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 as one problem. No. I'm afraid there are so many parts to this yeah. that yeah. need to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I personally get a bit tired of sort of millennial bashing. I think, they, you know, I, I had it easy just because of when I was born. Um, and that's ridiculously unfair. And so I think that living in the moment kind of attitude absolutely is a, is a result of looking ahead thinking, oh, I could work for another 15 years and not have saved up my deposit. Mm. It's quite but, tough. You know, the biggest thing for them, although that attitude is understandable, mm. like you say, mm. you know, going back to your point earlier on, you know, it's in retirement, you know, a lot of the baby boomers today are able to think about retirement because of the equity that's locked into their property yeah. that they can unlock to allow them to look after it's themselves. Their pension, into the, yeah. yeah. But actually, if, the, if the, some of the millennials, for example, are not going to do that, are actually going to end up as generation rent forever till they're 65, like you were saying, well, then that's a. They'll become a burden on the state. Yeah. Well, well, yes and no, because if that wasn't available, you'd make other arrangements. If you didn't have hyperinflated property, you'd look at other ways of providing Perhaps. for that point when you get to um, the day when you want to hang up your spurs. <laughs> you just do it differently. 
Yeah. yeah. I would yeah, probably no. be working till I'm about 95, I think. Most of my family did. <laughs> Sadly, my, or whatever. My main but, plan is just keep going. Right, we'll move on to our final topic for today, which is longer term tenancies and the elusive yeah. incentives that the government have alluded to. Because I think Philip Hammond mentioned in the budget, didn't he, that they were going to be maybe looking yeah. at uh, trying to give some tax breaks for landlords who agree to longer tenancies. So what are your thoughts on this, Tony? Longer tenancies make every kind of commercial sense. It, yeah. you know, if you don't want to have someone in your property long term, mm. build a hotel. <laughs> or Airbnb. <laughs> or Airbnb. Yeah, I, I totally. Yeah. And I think that is so right. So why, hasn't, have, why haven't they done anything about it yet? Why haven't they implemented it? Could it be that another politician is just talking hot air? <laughs> really? <laughs> you might say that. Because people take too much lead from politics and, and tax mm. and don't look what's in front of their face from a, a prima facie business. Yeah, case. because it could somebody, you, somebody, you can do that yourself, you can't do it you? Yourself. You can do whatever contract you want. Yeah. You, you, you've got to be careful. You know, you, you, there's a balance between protecting the tenant, their rights, and protecting yeah, not you. Not ending up with a squatter. Correct. Mm. If, however, you're building the right properties, and you're getting the right tenants in for the right reasons, mm, mm. then having a, a longer term you know, lease, yeah. why not? can be fantastically, mutually wonderful. Oh, it, it's back to the donut economics. I mean, it just works yeah. in every conceivable yeah. way. I mean, a great around. friend of mine, she's a single mother, she's a businesswoman, she's got three children, she's rented the same property now for 10 years. It's their home, oh, and she yeah. views it as their home, she maintains it as her home. Yeah. Um, and, and she pays considerable amount of rent, but her landlord does is you know got to the point they probably could put it up a bit, but they don't because she's mm, exactly. the perfect tenant. I think I think what's worth looking at is clearly you know uh, longer term tenancies work if you've got a tenant that is paying what you want mm. and you're able to meet your mortgage payments and respects uh, your property as and well and respects your property yeah. and all of those work. Yeah. The, the the real issue is of course when it doesn't yes. work in your favour, yes. and so. And then we talk really, we're back to the accidental landlord that maybe has one property, yeah. the impact of cash flow stopping for them, yeah. mm. and then because of the tenant rights, the yeah. inability to yeah. access that can cause a lot of, a lot of trouble for the person yeah. that's being a landlord. Yeah. Yeah. And then we start to say, well, okay, well maybe you need four, five, ten properties to have that kind of diversification, mm. which means even if one goes down, or, or the cash flow on one property reduces, you can still kind of manage your overall portfolio. Mm. So I think it's it's a downside protection for mm. the smaller landlord. It is really really important. I mean, yeah. institutions yes. can obviously absorb this, and you know, protecting tenants. Everybody wants that. You know, yeah. we, we were talking about rogue yeah. landlords before. Yeah. No one wants rogue landlords, yeah. but appropriate protection for landlords that are just trying to do the right thing. And can can sometimes get into difficulty if yeah. the cash flow is starting to fall. Uh, 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 well, sorry, and this is a problem cool. brewing in in that the accidental landlord, as a result of Section Twenty Four changes, uh, in two to three years, could be paying or having to pay more tax than the rents they're getting in. Right. They now can't afford to maintain the payments, the mortgage payments. The lender says, "Okay, we want our property back." You've now got the issue with the tenant who's yeah, just yeah, started yeah, a new yeah. AST or a longer term yeah. one. Who's responsible for that mess? Well, exactly. Do you know, I've got a solution. And it was not maybe a complete solution, but see what you think, gentlemen. I think more face-to-face -face interaction w is required. And I think actual dialogue should be allowed, whether the property is going to be managed or not, between tenant and landlord. When I'm interviewing a babysitter or if I'm interviewed for a job, you do that face-to-face -face and you get an instinct about people, don't you? And you can have all the paperwork, but I think that that would help massively if you met your landlord and you could you soon yeah, get an idea of what kind of person they were absolutely. and vice versa absolutely. what do you think well i think that's a, i think that's a nice idea and it would it would help any kind of sensible interaction has got to be good yeah but um once again it's not just one problem and it's not just private sector landlords you know with private sector to landlords it's quite easy really you draw up a lease you know, that lease conforms to current legislation or it can be changed. But you sign it, I sign it, so why don't we just do what it says? That's quite an easy way of solving any difficulties there. Mm -hmm. Where I see a lot of the difficulty, and again, contributing to this shortage of housing, is this. We haven't got any churn on the social housing. Mm. Now, if you're in a property that's um, 
subsidised in terms of rent, that's fine. As a decent society, we need to have a safety net for those people less fortunate. We need it to be there at all times and to be funded properly. But I do just wonder what happens when that family or that couple come out of that need for subsidisation. Are they asked to move? No, they're not. So I've got to say, controversially, I, I would like to see means testing on, on social housing. And I think if we look at life, it goes in sort of probably five or six year cycles, mm -hmm. you know, preschool, school, later school, yeah. university. Yeah. So I would suggest that every six years you're subjected to a means test if you're, if you're benefiting from subsidised property. Yeah. And at that point, I wouldn't be as harsh as to say, well, you've got to move. Yeah. But what I would say is you now go on to a commercial rent if you can afford it. Yeah. And then the councils can either sell that property as an investment if it's a long term tenancy or, or, or whatever else. I think okay. to, to live in social housing is not a choice. No, it's not. Well, it shouldn't be true. If you can afford to provide for yourself, you should provide for yourself. That's Absolutely. part of the social compact. Yes. In principle, what you say is a good idea. Yeah, yeah you're right, it is controversial. I suppose it would avoid those kind of real sitting tenants and staying in the yeah. same situation. Well, we've, had, we, we, we've had publicity recently, haven't we, where um, leading political figures yeah. are still living in council houses earning 150. Please, give mm. it a <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm Sorry. afraid, I know it's a, it's a hot topic, but sadly, gents, yeah. that is all we've got time for today. But please join us next time when industry experts will be sharing their views, tackling other topics within the world of property and finance. From me, Gemma Forte, I'll see you next time. Mm.